You can ask in Japanese. I'm sure somebody will translate if you want. So. Yeah. Uh, do you think Iran would be for collectivist uh, social policies such as redistribution if uh, policies or collectivist policies such as redistribution leads to individual individualistic uh, No, she, she would definitely be against them. And, and she would argue that it's impossible that they can lead to happiness. And, and, and she'd also ask, whose happiness, right? Whose happiness are you measuring? So how do you have redistribution of policies? You have to take from some by force and give to others. And maybe you could argue, I think she would argue against you, but maybe you could argue that the people receiving the money are happier. But what about the money that was taken away? So you're going to average the happiness over everybody and have a measure of whether it rose. She would reject any kind of utilitarian measure like that. Right? So Rand was against any form of coercion. So the idea of taking money from some and giving it to others, no matter what the outcome is, she would be against. And again, she would be against collectivistic measures of happiness. Right? So if, if you made this person less happy, nothing can justify that, even if you're distributing the happiness to other people and it's greater there. Right? That's the whole point of individualism. What's important is the individual's right to his own stuff, to his own life, and you can't and you shouldn't ever sacrifice that for the sake of any cause. Right? And so... So yes, I think the premise behind it, she would object to the premise of, 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 of the question, but also to the, to the outcome. I don't even believe that when you give people money, like welfare, you're making them happy. Because I think happiness, happiness isn't a consequence of money. Happiness doesn't result from money. Happiness results from the process of earning money. So happiness is a consequence of attaining your values your rational values. So people, for example, who don't work, it's, it's almost impossible to be happy unless you work, unless you have a career, unless you have a purpose, unless you have goals, values, things that you're striving to attain. When we take people and we tell them, you don't have to work, here, get a check from the government. We're here to help you, right? Here's a check, don't work. You're actually, in my view, institutionalizing them into unhappiness. Because they'll never go out and get that job that, and, get, and, and, and pursue a career that will actually give them the kind of self-esteem and happiness they should attain. Can I go deeper into that? Yep. Uh, I, I really do agree with the concept of that the concept of responsibility is necessary in individual happiness. But, we, uh, but when we see like, economic studies that uh, that point to, such as the gap in wealth leads to a, a higher crime rate in suburban cities. Can we not argue that policies such as redistribution would indirectly make the rich happier because it would lead to a, it would not lead to a higher crime rate in suburban cities? Well, <laughs> the studies are wrong. To start out with, right, the studies are just wrong. I've got a book called Equals Unfair that take on the whole inequality debate. There's just no correlation and there's no causality between these kind of features. So, for example, inequality in the United States has increased over the last 40 years, right? It's dramatically increased. Everybody says this. Okay, let's assume that's all true. I'm even skeptical of that, but let's assume that that's true. Inequality has increased in the United States over the last 30 to 40 years. What has happened to crime rates in the United States during that period? They've shrunk. They haven't gone up. Inequality in Great Britain has expanded. Crime rates have gone down. I mean, crime rates were the highest in the 70s and 80s. And actually, the 70s and 80s had, according to Gini coefficients, were much lower. So inequality was much lower than they were in the, today. So the correlation between crime and inequality is a myth. It's, it's myth. Now, what happens is they do these, these studies where they include really, really, really high crime countries which have very high inequality and they assume causality. But there is no causality. I think the whole, the whole debate, the whole discussion of the last, I'd say, eight years, ten years about inequality is empty. It's, it's, it's silly. 
it's, it's detached from any reality. Um, there is no economic theory, for example, none, zero, that links inequality to things like economic growth or to economic problems. And yet when you run certain regressions, you can find correlations. But correlation is not causation. And you have to think about inequality is high in the United States and inequality is high in Zimbabwe. But there are big differences between the two countries, right? That have nothing to do with inequality, that are maybe generating the actual problems that people are observing in a place like Zimbabwe. So, and you really have to dig into the, 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 the people who talk about inequality, you have to dig into what they're actually doing. And, and I don't trust mainstream economists uh, because I think they, they have a philosophical political agenda and they shape their economics to adapt it. And, and Thomas Piketty, the, the guy who really made inequality the big thing when he came out with his book in about, what was it, six, seven years ago, um, is, is a great example of that. Uh, the, the data is often wrong. His interpretation is completely misleading. It's a completely bogus book, but he is treated like a king today. I mean, everywhere he goes in the world, he gets red carpet treatment. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just unbelievable to me, but it's bad economics. He, he'll probably get a Nobel Prize for it, but it's bad economics and it's bad data. Um, but let's say it was true, <laughs> just for the sake of argument. Let's say what you argue is true. That is redistribution of wealth lowers crime. Well, if that were true, right, and if that were the real causal mechanism, and you would argue that the rich then um, uh, are better off because crime against them is lower because there's redistribution, then they would do it voluntarily. They'd have an incentive to do it voluntarily. But there's never, and this is, this is Ayn Rand very much thought in principles, and, and, and it's, I think it's really important to think in principles, and unfortunately we're not taught to think in principles. We're, we're very much taught to be so-called pragmatic. Whatever works, whatever, sh you never use force against another human being unless you're acting in self-defense. So even though you think, you philosopher king think, Oh, if I take money from you and give it to him, you will be better off. No. The only thing you can do is argue, is convince. So you could go to rich people and say, if you take a bunch of money and you give it to poor people, you'll be better off. And some will agree and some won't, and some will do it and some won't, but it's their individual personal choice. And it's not like in a free society, a completely capitalist society, there wouldn't be some redistribution. It just wouldn't be coerced. It would be charity. It would be voluntary. Right? So you can never, in, an, in Ayn Rand's world, you can never use coercion, even when you think it's good for somebody else. Right? So force is out. It's not a means for interaction between human beings. The only means to interact between human beings is, is reason. It's rational argument. It's debate. It's this, this is why free speech is so important, right? They're crucial to the foundation of, of civilization is our ability to reason with one another, to debate one another, to convince one another. Because when we can't do that, what do we resort to? You know, a gun, force. So. Uh, just on that point, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I've just come from Japan, and, uh, sorry, um, New Zealand, and um, the Prime Minister there has just. Uh, uh, prohibited people from uh, reading the uh, uh, manifesto of the uh, Australian, actually. Uh, who uh, the guy who killed, killed, killed the Muslims, Muslims in, in, yeah, in the mosque. Yeah, the Muslims in yeah. uh, Christchurch. Yeah. And uh, she's prohibited that people from reading it. I, I, I downloaded it in Japan, so that's perfectly okay. Uh, and their narrative is that uh, white supremacists yeah. And his, his background is actually uh, communist, uh, yeah. eco-fascist, uh, hates capitalism, uh, hates individualism, uh, identifies with China. Um, so I think that supports... Well, I mean, I think, I think there's a massive attack today in the West, all over the West, against free speech. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can say these ideas are despicable. They're ugly, they're disgusting. Uh, nobody should have to read them. Ideally, nobody would read them. But once you ban them, 
then A, you're making it sexy. You wouldn't have downloaded it if it wasn't banned, probably. I certainly will never download it unless just as an objection to the limitation, right? You make them, you make them interesting by banning them. And secondly, once you establish that you have the authority to decide which ideas people should read or shouldn't, then it's a very slippery slope. If you look today, today in, in Europe, the laws against uh, certain types of speech are only increasing. Uh, particularly if you say anything against Islam or anything against religion or anything against certain issues, you could go to jail in Europe today. But what's interesting is what were the first laws against speech in Europe post-World War II? All were done with good intentions. What were the first laws? Yeah, against Holocaust deniers. So you say, well, who wants to read Holocaust deniers? It's okay if we ban them. Yeah, nobody wants to read Holocaust deniers. They're, they're a bunch of idiots. They're a bunch of evil, you know, uh, 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 liars. But once you accept that the state has the authority to tell you you can't read something, then first it's Holocaust deniers, then it's something else, and now it's anybody who wants to be critical of Islam. But there's a lot to criticize about Islam. <laughs> I mean, it, it's okay to, you should criticize Islam, just like you should criticize Christianity, criticize Judaism, criticize any religion, any set of ideas you should be allowed to criticize. So once you allow in the name of good intentions, like the, this manifesto, which I will never read because I'm not interested, right, or Holocaust deniers or whatever, you've given the powers the authority now to determine what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, and it's a... It's a disaster. And I think you're seeing all across the world, you're seeing shrinkage of freedom of speech. I don't know what the situation is in Japan. In the United States, the only reason this is not really happening kind of at a, at a, at a, at a national level is because we have it in the Constitution, right? We have a First Amendment that, that makes it almost impossible to rule out reading certain books or not to be able to download certain materials. But if we didn't have a First Amendment, I believe there would be a lot of states in America who would be passing what's called hate speech laws and laws that restrict, restrict freedom of speech. So people don't believe in the First Amendment anymore in America. It, the legal system protects the First Amendment because it's, in a, it's, it's the value of having a constitution. Because even when people stop believing in the ideas, it still functions. Now in the end it won't. In the end it will be written out if enough people don't believe in it. But for a long time, it's sustainable. Right? So you still have free speech in the United States in spite of the fact that I think a significant number of Americans, maybe a majority, don't believe in it anymore. On, on the left in America, if you go to universities, there are ideas you cannot express. Uh, people are attacked for expressing those ideas uh, and, and, and uh, the silenced and there's violence involved and that's clear violations of, of the ideas of free speech. And it's sad when the, when the government it does not protect people's ability to speak. That's the one area in which you're seeing an erosion of free speech in the U.S. Any other? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, what would you say is the relevance of Brown's thought in contemporary United States? Uh, I was just wondering, um, much of the conclusion you have drawn from Brown's thought and probably yourself uh, sounds quite familiar to me, probably because I have read Robert Nozick's uh, uh, the book um, under the supervision of my professor, who is who is also libertarian. Yeah. And um, I did understand that Rand's thought does constitute major part of American people's philosophy. But I was wondering what is so fresh about her thought in the 21st century, especially after the Tariff war the president broke out. Especially after what? Tariff war. Uh, tariff war. The tariff war. Um, well, so first let me say, I, I think everything about her philosophy is still fresh. I, I don't think anybody represents her philosophy, including Nozick. Nozick rejects Ayn Rand's ethics. Um, and he rejects her formulation of individual rights the way she does. So. I don't think, uh, Nozick accepted some of her ideas, um, and certainly 
within the libertarian movement, many people were influenced by, by, by Ayn Rand, uh, some more than others. Uh, and, and she's had a profound impact on the libertarian movement in the United States. But that's her impact on them, and yet many libertarians don't accept her full philosophy, and I think it's to their detriment. My view is that if you look at intellectual history of the last 100 years or 50, 60 years, if the key free market economists and thinkers of the 20th century had embraced Ayn Rand, we would be living in a different world today. So I, I think the fact that Hayek and Friedman and, and Mises, and Mises was the closest to Ayn Rand, basically rejected her philosophy, I think has put the libertarian movement backwards 50 to 100 years. So I think, I think, I think it, it, it's still going to take a longer time for them to rediscover Ayn Rand, but I don't believe you will have a free market slash capitalist movement in America or in the world without Ayn Rand's ideas. I don't think it's sustainable because nobody else in the libertarian movement is a real philosopher. Nobody else in the libertarian movement actually has a philosophical foundation for capitalism. Um, you know, you have, to be, you have to be an advocate of egoism and you have to be an advocate for reason. And those, uh, I mean, uh, most libertarian philosophers reject both of those assumptions and therefore I think will fail, have to fail. So you can't just start with politics and economics. Now, in terms of the influence she has on the political world today, given tariffs, I mean, tariffs, I think, suggest that she has no influence <laughs> or very little influence because she would be horrified by, I think, the current administration of Donald Trump. I think she would reject almost everything about this administration. I mean, he's done a few things that are good and that she would, you know, maybe say positive things like cutting corporate taxes and, and, uh, and reducing regulation. But there's no point in cutting taxes if you don't stop spending like crazy, which is something, you know, the Japanese should learn from as well, right? If you run deficits and increase government debt, then you're sucking money out of the private economy. You're sucking money out of the hands of capitalists and giving it to the central planners to distribute. And therefore, you have an inefficient economy and therefore growth rates are very low, which is true in Japan and true in the United States right now. So government spending is out of control in the United States. Levels of debt are going out of control in the United States, both, all of which she would be offended by. But she would also object to the kind of cronyism that Donald Trump is institutionalizing in the United States, where he will tell CEOs where they can build plants and where they shouldn't build plants. And he, he told uh, what Ford or somebody was Ford that they can't shut down a plant because uh, you know they were going to they were going to close a plant in Ohio, and he harassed them that they couldn't shut it down. And ultimately, they find a, they found a buyer for it for, to convert it to something else. But but the, the president of the United States gets involved in decisions like that. I call him. I call Donald Trump on, on Twitter. Uh, 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 what is it? Uh, central planner in chief. I mean, he really views himself as a central planner. He's running the economy like you would run a business. So all of that is very antagonistic to Ayn Rand's view of the world. Um, and certainly this idea of raising tariffs, tariffs are tax. They're a tax on, on your people. You know, it's not, it's, it's not a tool of diplomacy. It's not a tool of negotiation. It's a tax. And you don't raise taxes and pretend that you're a capitalist. You don't raise taxes and pretend that you're pro, that make America first, or you're pro-American. It's an anti-American tax. Because who's it hurting? It's hurting your own citizens. The Chinese don't pay tariffs. Americans pay tariffs. Right. So, and, and, and nobody's defending today free trade. I mean, and, and nobody's defending free markets. And the fact that we subsidize and regulate and control, all of that is antagonistic to Rand's view. Uh, of, of government, and the fact that there's an erosion in America today of the separation of powers, of the role of the presidency and, the, and, and versus the role of Congress, versus the roles of the courts, that, that the presidency is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more powerful, all things that she would object to as the founding fathers would object to. Uh, and there's no real movement. I mean, why is the president, why can the president of the United States impose tariffs unilaterally without Congress. 
that's, you know, that contradicts the spirit of the Constitution. It's because Congress doesn't want to have them make those decisions. So it's basically written laws that say, we're not involved in tariffs. The president can do it. Or the president could do it for national security reasons without defining what national security is. So that now uh, Trump is saying that importing automobiles is a national security threat to the United States. I mean, it's insane. Right? So even though many people within Trump's administration have read Rand, Ayn Rand, will say they really love Ayn Rand, they don't govern that way. And that was true in the Reagan administration. That was true in the Bush administration. Many people in the administration read her, loved her, didn't matter. It wasn't, it didn't, wasn't actually applied in the way they ran government. They were all statists. They were all growing the size of government, growing the power of government, growing their interference in our lives. And as long as that's happening, she is not having, having the kind of influence I would like her to have. Uh, we are running out of time. Um, if there's any, any last quick question. question, yeah. Anybody hasn't asked? Yeah. Yeah. I, I seem to have the perception that reason is not enough. Okay. You, let's say you have a few individuals where reason has basically gained a priority in their lives. Is there a threshold or a point after which they begin to impact society, and we actually have a, 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 a push against? Uh, government, for example. Is there some kind of threshold, some sociological, socially based threshold after which you have so many peace people who are reasonable that actually begins to impact politics? Sure, I, I think there is. Uh, but I think it's, it's, not, it's not a numbers game. It's who these people are. So what changes the world uh, is the minority, and it's usually the intellectual minority. So it's, it's the intellectuals advocating for reason. It's the intellectuals advocating for freedom. Um, so it's when you see the intellectual world dominated by people who believe in, in freedom, who believe in individualism, that's when you'll start seeing political change. It doesn't have to be the majority of people, because sadly, majority of people are followers. But who do they follow? Whether we like it or not, they follow, in a sense, the, the writers of the New York Times, right? Or the professors at the universities, or the people who show up on television, right? The, the intellectuals who show up on television. The intellectuals lead a culture. They drive a culture. It, the left took over America's institutions through the universities, through the, the intellectual elites. They became the professors, but ultimately they became the lawyers and the judges, and then ultimately the politicians. But it all starts at the universities. And then, of course, once you have the universities, all the other people who uh, go into journalism were trained in the universities, and all the people who go into all the intellectual professions are trained in the universities. And as long as you don't have a mechanism to train in the, uh, intellectuals, and as long as you don't dominate the intellectuals, you can't have real you know, uh, uh, progress. You can't really move a culture. Whether we like it or not, intellectuals determine a culture. And the intellectuals overwhelmingly are left, and therefore even the right in America is left. I mean, Donald Trump is a Democrat. He's not a Republican, not a traditional Republican. Everything on his agenda is, I mean, tariffs are Bernie Sanders' thing. Anti-immigration was always the left. The Democrats were anti-immigration. Why? Because they didn't want cheap labor competing with unions. So, you know, that's a left. Now, it's also combined with a nativist type xenophobic nationalism, which is on the right. But it's a combination, right? But you think about policy after policy, he is, and, and it's no accident that he, he usually voted Democratic, right? He was a Democrat. He was a registered Democrat until a few years ago. So, most of the policies of the Republican Party, when they actually are in power, are left. That's because the whole intellectual world is left of center. There's very few intellectuals on the right. I mean, there's some conservatives and some neocons and some paleocons, and, but they are relatively weak in comparison. What is it? 
90-something percent of in certain fields in the humanities are, are, are leftists. And not just slightly left of center. We're talking about way out there left. Right? And it's hard to make progress in a world where the intellectual space is so dominated by one political or, or more deeply, more, one philosophical view of the world. And the right has been impotent when it comes to dealing with that. And the whole political map has shifted left constantly, both on social issues, which often has been a good thing, not a bad thing, and on economic issues. The whole thing has shifted leftwards because the intellectuals control it. So to me, reason is the key, but, and it needs to, you know, so we need to overcome the, the postmodernists and all the variety of, of different uh, anti-reason ideologies that exist on, on, at universities and campuses. Define reason properly, because I think there are a lot of people who claim they're for reason, but are not really for reason. They're not really for evidence, facts, logic, you know, reality. And, and when that becomes this idea of the importance and significance of reason as the, um, the way in which we know about the world, and coupled, when you couple that with individualism, when that is the dominant intellectual, that's what dominates the intellectuals in terms of the ideas, then it's just a matter of time and the world will change. But it's going to take a long time. We're way behind. We're way behind. Um, thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Burke, for offering a, the essence of Rand's thought, and of course to Akizaka-san for outlining